1971, Iran threw an extravagant and exclusive party to commemorate the 2500th anniversary of the Persian Empire. The party had a grandeur never before seen in the world's recorded history. It had delicious food from the world's best restaurant, exquisite drinks, luxurious accommodations, medieval European-style decorations, and more importantly, the party had the most decorated guest list. Heads of state from 65 different countries, emperors, kings and queens, princes and princesses, sheiks, sultans, and business figures of all kinds from five different continents. The venue of the event was not some ancient castle or a seven-star hotel. Instead, everything was organized from scratch, in the middle of a desert, by building plastic tents. The cost of all of this? Not a million dollars, not a billion dollars. This party almost cost a dynasty. It proved to be a stepping stone for the rise of the Iranian Revolution and the fall of the Iranian monarchy that changed the country forever. This is the story of the most expensive party the world has ever seen. This is the Shah of Iran's Billion Dollar Party. This video is sponsored by Dashlane. Secure your passwords with Dashlane for free at dashlane.com slash sidenote. Also, get 10% off the premium plan by using the code SIDENOTE. 1960s Iran was a complicated mess. To give you a simplified picture, because it's essential in order to grasp the bigger story, Iran in the 60s was a constitutional monarchy ruled by Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, also called the King of Kings. The Shah was one of the richest men in the world, and he had the absolute power in the government. He could appoint prime minister, he could dissolve the parliament, raise an army, declare war, conclude a peace. His words meant law, and he was not willing to share his powers with anyone. Seventeen years prior, the Shah toppled a democratic popular prime minister in a coup orchestrated by American and British forces because the Shah believed that the prime minister was getting too powerful. Being the son of a former king, the Shah had only seen luxury in his life. He had studied in Switzerland and was very fond of Western culture and modern lifestyle. He claimed that he wanted to make Iran a more modern and free society by empowering women and the poor, but this was largely refuted as propaganda because on the other side, the Shah had been sacking free speech and punishing every voice of dissent against his rule. There were no civil liberties in the country. The Shah's regime had the highest number of political prisoners and the highest rate of death penalties in the world. His secret police kidnapped and murdered people at their will. Despite being an oil-rich state, the socio-economic condition of the country was bad. Almost half of the population lived below poverty, cities lacked basic infrastructure, and rural areas had an acute shortage of water, medical facilities, and educational institutions. Iran needed some basic reforms to elevate the standards of living, but the Shah had something else on his mind. One day, the Shah had this idea that he should invite the world's most elite people, emperors, kings, presidents, and sheiks, to Iran to throw a super extravagant exclusive party for them. He believed that this multi-day event would boost Iran's global image. It would show the world what a magnificent country it had been and how it's reviving its lost glory, its lost position as a superpower, like a phoenix rising from the flames heralding a great civilization. The occasion couldn't have been better. It was the 2500th anniversary of the foundation of the glorious Persian Empire by Cyrus the Great. The Shah saw this as a golden opportunity to portray himself as Iran's new Cyrus. An organizing committee was quickly set up, invitations were sent to people around the world, and preparations for the event kicked off more than a year in advance. The biggest hurdle was that Iran lacked the infrastructure that was required to host such a marvelous event. They didn't have grand hotels or luxurious castles to keep their elite guests, so after much consideration and going through different options, they chose a desert, the dry, dusty, desolate patch of lands of the ancient city of Persepolis as the venue for the event. It was decided that a royal village would be set up in these deserts using tents, but first they would turn these deserts into a forest, so they imported trees, an incredible number of trees. Around 15,000 trees and an equal number of flowering plants were flown in to be planted on site. 
Iran was already suffering from an acute water shortage, so planting trees in the desert for a three-day event was an insane idea, but the Shah wanted to give his guests a surreal experience. They also dug out four hectares of earth and delivered it to the site so that George Truffaut, the famous florist from Versailles, could create a perfumed garden with a variety of roses and tall cypresses. The deserted site was infested with poisonous snakes and scorpions, whose sting could kill the distinguished guests, so they sprayed chemicals over the 30-kilometer area and removed a truckload of creepy crawlies. They even found some unknown species of reptiles, which were then sent to universities for research purposes. To populate the newly made forest, the Shah imported 50,000 songbirds from Europe and released them on the site. 20,000 sparrows were brought in from Spain, most of which died within a few days because of the lack of water and the adverse climate. At noon, the temperatures of the site topped 40 degrees Celsius, and at night they dropped below zero. The Shah also built a golf course in the desert with bunkers, greens, and fairways. Normally, in events like this, you would expect to see local artists and craftsmen do most of the work. After all, the whole point of the party was to showcase Iran's glory, but the Shah was a sophisticated man who only trusted world-class professionals, so he outsourced most of the work to renowned European companies. To build the royal tent city, the Shah hired the famous Jean Sen Company from Paris. Jean Sen came with a plan to build air-conditioned luxury suites and drape them with traditional Persian cloth to make them look like tents. Each one of these lavishly furnished tents had two bedrooms, two bathrooms, a sitting room, and a kitchen with a cook and servers available 24 hours a day. Each tent could easily accommodate five people. Hundreds of French architects, interior designers, and craftsmen worked for over a year to build these tents on an airfield outside Paris. They were then transported to Persepolis in hundreds of airplanes to be assembled on site. On the site, 50 tents were arranged along five avenues, radiating out from a central fountain, representing five continents of the world. In total, the tent city covered 160 acres of land and had two more, bigger tents, the Tent of Honor for reception of the dignitaries, and the Banqueting Hall. We'll come to that later. For food, the Shah signed a deal with the famous Maximes de Paris. Based in Paris, Maximes was considered the best restaurant in the world at the time, and the party got even more attention after this deal was made. Maximes closed their restaurants for almost two weeks and sent all their equipment, chefs, waiters, and other staff to Persepolis ten days in advance. Eighteen tons of food was flown in, all again from Paris. A quarter of a million eggs, 2,700 kilograms of beef, and 1,280 kilograms of fowl, among other things. The legendary hotelier Max Bluet came out of retirement to supervise the banquet. The menu was initially kept a closely guarded secret, but then it got leaked to the press and created a scandal. With hundreds of goods being imported from around the world to this desolate desert site, logistics were a big challenge. To facilitate the transportation of goods, the Shah built an airfield in Shiraz, some 50 kilometers away from the venue site in Persepolis, and a highway connecting these two places. The Iranian Air Force was put to the task of hauling stuff. For almost six months, the Imperial Iranian Air Force made repeated trips between Shiraz and Paris, flying goods which were then trucked carefully in army lorries to Persepolis. Each month, supplies were driven down the desert highway to deliver building materials for the Janssen designed air conditioned tents, Italian drapes and curtains, Baccarat crystals, Limoges china with the Pahlavi coat of arms, Porto linens, an exclusive Robert Haviland cup and saucer service, and thousands of bottles of expensive wines. They brought 30 tons of kitchen equipment from Paris just for Maxime's for food preparation. During the course of the event, their airplanes brought ice cubes the size of a garage. Now comes the most important part of preparation, security. The event would be the biggest gathering of world leaders and monarchs in one place, and the Shah was already facing people's anger and resentment for many reasons. There were many serious acts of violence during the time, so ensuring security was a big challenge. 
there were suspicions of guerrillas trying to sabotage the party. So the Shah deployed his secret police and troops, 65,000 of them, to protect a few hundred guests. There were security checkpoints every few meters. There was a danger that someone might poison the food, so they made the banqueting hall the most guarded place on the site. Only a few people had access to it. Chefs and servers were thoroughly vetted, and additional servers were brought in from Switzerland. Apparently, this wasn't enough, so the Shah went a step further. He locked down Iran's border for the entire duration of the event, so no one could enter or leave the country except for the guests. All universities and schools were closed. The Shah's secret police raided houses and captured thousands of young men on suspicion. All student bodies were dismantled and student leaders were locked behind bars. Some of them were even captured months in advance. Because the event was so dear to the Shah, a big chunk of money was spent on publicizing the event. The Shah signed deals with TV channels in different countries to live broadcast the event to foreign audiences. Iran's National Film Board commissioned a prominent filmmaker to gather a crew to make a film of the event. The English version of the film would be called Flames of Persia. Hollywood actor-director Orson Welles agreed to narrate the English text written by MacDonald Hastings in return for the Shah's brother-in-law funding Welles' own film, The Other Side of the Wind. Like I said, everything was being handled by world-class professionals only. The Shah had planned to send copies of the film to theaters around the world for public display. Throughout the year prior to the event, Iranian embassies in different countries were asked to organize parties, conferences, symposiums, and other cultural activities to draw attention to the main event. Several books were published on Iran, and their translated copies were distributed around the world. The promotion of the event was largely successful. Media around the world picked up the story. Every other day, there were new stories about the party, new leaks about the menu and guests, who's wearing what, and who's taking whom to the party. Thirteen months of painstaking preparation was nearing its end. The Agricultural Department planted acres of small pine trees along the newly asphalted road leading to the stone ruins. In order to light up the dark 30-mile road from Shiraz to Persepolis, the National Iranian Oil Company set up torches fueled by oil barrels and distanced them 100 meters apart from each other. The Ministry of Tourism constructed two brand new hotels in Shiraz, named Karush and Dariush, each with a 150-room capacity. Lesser prominent guests and media persons would be kept there. Every element of the tent city was meticulously designed to within a quarter of an inch to feel magnificent and fantastically well-ordered, something straight out of an Arabian night story. When the Shah of Iran throws a big bash, the sky's no limit, wrote an American newspaper. The Iranian dresses for the party were all designed and made by French tailors using gold threads, flashy gems, and diamonds, costing tens of thousands of dollars for each dress. In a crowd of world leaders, monarchs, and their ladies, no one wanted to look any less impressive than anyone else, so even the attending guests went out of their way to arrange sumptuous dresses to wear to the party. The wife of the Vice President of the United States got caught in a scandal after she was seen wearing unusually expensive dresses at the event. As everything comes to an end, preparations did too. The last roses of Truffaut were laid and the fountains were switched on. Iranian officials were on their toes. The Shah's reputation was at stake. October 14, 1971. On the morning of the first day, news media from around the world flocked to the ancient city of Persepolis to see the unfolding of this grand promise. In the beginning, people weren't very optimistic. It wasn't easy to believe that Iran could throw the kind of party it had promised. But with each passing airplane, the list of VIPs attending the program kept on increasing, and the dream started to take the shape of reality. Both the Western democracies and the countries of the Soviet bloc did their best to be present at the event. President Nixon had initially planned to attend, but Secret Service didn't give him security clearance, so he sent Vice President Spiro Agnew instead. From the Soviet side, Chairman of the Presidium Nikolai Podyorny joined the party. 
Austria, Finland, and Switzerland were represented by their heads of state. France, Italy, South Korea, and Swaziland by their prime ministers. Western Germany sent the president of the Bundestag, and Portugal sent its foreign minister. Even Pope Paul VI sent a special representative. Presidents of Bulgaria, Brazil, Turkey, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Indonesia, Pakistan, Lebanon, and India were part of the party. There were also five African presidents, South Africa, Senegal, Mauritania, Dahomey, and Zaire. The presidents of Yugoslavia and Romania had arrived with their first ladies. Canada and Australia were represented by their governors general, China sent their ambassador, and Poland had their deputy chairman. However, the focus and attention were understandably on royalty. Never could anyone see so many kings, queens, princes, and princesses all gathered in one place. The Emperor of Ethiopia, the royal couples of Denmark, Belgium, Nepal, and Greece, the kings of Jordan, Norway, and Lesotho, the emirs of Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, and Abu Dhabi, the Sultan of Oman, Musiban and Princess of Afghanistan, the princes and princesses of Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Monaco, France, Sweden, Spain, Italy, Japan, and Morocco all came to the event together with the Prince of Thailand, the Princess of Jordan, and the royal members from Malaysia. Queen Elizabeth did not attend the party because the royal house did not want to be in a position where their monarch was seen as paying homage to the King of Kings. Instead, they sent her husband Philip of Edinburgh and their daughter Anne to Persepolis. A couple of other guests also did not attend because of domestic pressure. The Shah was seen as a dictator in many Western countries. The Shah went to Shiraz himself to receive the more important guests. He had ordered 250 bulletproof limousines just to transport his guests from the airfield in Shiraz to the venue site in Persepolis. The celebration started with a simple ceremony at the tomb of Cyrus the Great shortly before noon. Accompanied by Empress Farah and Crown Prince Reza, the Shah, dressed in his emperor's uniform, delivered an emotion-packed eulogy to his illustrious predecessor and vowed that Iranians today would continue to prove worthy heirs of their glorious past. Each head of state was given one tent for himself and his important companions. Among other luxuries, a tapestry, with a picture of the head of state who was staying there woven into it, was hung on the wall of each tent. Dozens of craftsmen spent months to prepare these woven portraits. Since most of the European royal families were related to one another, they got the opportunity to meet and hang out with each other. They would go to each other's tents and have drinks in the evening. Many journalists later reported how surreal the whole experience was. You may find the Vice President of the United States chilling in a chair outside. In the next tent, you might find the King of Denmark, and in another one, the leader of the Soviet Union. It felt like a tiny town where only the most elite people lived. In a separate tent near the heliport, the Shah built a social club to entertain guests in case they got bored. The social club had a reception area, a bar, a restaurant, and even a gambling casino. A special tent with 16 hairdressing salons, four makeup salons, and one salon for men were set up. Paris's top hairdressers and makeup experts with their teams were invited to provide a service to guests and their ladies. They were given special training to improve their speed to tackle the time constraints, especially learning how to properly place a tiara in just a few minutes. A team of Paris's fashion designers was also called to accommodate last-minute adjustments. A bunker was specially built in the tent city to secure ladies' precious jewelry. As you can guess, everything was diligently pre-planned to avoid any surprise or discomfort. On the evening of the first day, the Shah threw an exquisite dinner party to his guests in the banqueting tent which dominated the canvas tent city. The roll call of majestic sounding titles, the aides de camp hovering in attendance, the chandelier hanging high above the tables, the gold-plated cutlery used by heads of state, all seem to harken back to a European court of a century or more ago. Food was served on a 70 meter long continuous serpentine table with guests sitting on one side. 125 women had spent six months embroidering the tablecloth. The other guests, who included ambassadors and the companions of the heads of state, sat in groups of 12 at smaller tables. 
This was arguably the first time in recorded history when rulers from such diverse countries and ideologies had gathered at a cultural event. People from the East, people from the West, developed countries, underdeveloped countries, communists, monarchs, former colonies, all equal at one stage, sitting side by side, enjoying their meal. Some guests later dubbed the atmosphere as a setting from a James Bond movie. Needless to say, the table had the most delicious food possible at the time. The menu came in a thick booklet in two languages, Persian and French. Without getting into the details, I'll leave you with the fact that they even had roasted peacock meat on the menu that was served with restored tail feathers. 600 guests feasted on a menu never to be repeated or forgotten for almost six hours, making it the longest and most lavish official banquet in modern history, as recorded in successive editions of the Guinness Book of World Records. Iran, being a religiously Islamic country, wasn't fond of alcohol, but the Shah's party was drowning in expensive booze. 2,500 bottles of champagne, 1,000 bottles of Bordeaux, 1,000 bottles of Burgundy, to name the specials. The champagne was from 1911, and the vintage cognac was from 1860. A cellar was built specifically for keeping wine in Persepolis four weeks before the celebration began. Everyone and everything was there, but if there were something missing from the party, then it was the Iranians themselves. To maintain the exclusivity of the party, the Shah hadn't invited his own ministers. Only a handful of those who were looking after the preparation were present. October 15th, 1971. The second day started with the main event. Guests gathered in a large patch of desert to witness the magnificent reenactment of the 2500 years of the Great Persian Empire. 1,724 soldiers with hundreds of Iran's finest horses and camels marched in the great parade of history representing the armies of the successive dynasties that had ruled Iran. The Shah had gone to great lengths to recreate the historically correct atmosphere. Costumes, fake beards and wigs, flamboyant uniforms, gold chariots, weapons, warships, and regalia were made after detailed research by teams of multinational military historians. Military workshops in Tehran had come up with various costumes. Ancient trumpets and other forgotten musical instruments were constructed to produce sounds not heard for centuries. There was even a replica of three ancient ships dating back to the glorious days of Xerxes for the occasion. A company of horsemen who had set out from Tehran the previous day rode up to the dais where the royal family and their guests were seated. A captain dressed like an Archaemenid dismounted to present the Shah with a handwritten parchment. After sundown, the guests followed their hosts into the starlit Persian night for a marvelous performance of sound and light among the great stones of ancient Persepolis. In the dramatized voices of different Persian rulers, the glorious days of Iran were remembered. Later that night, a show of fireworks were planned which came out as a surprise to the guests. When the fireworks went up in the sky, many guests got scared because they believed that the site was under terrorist attack. October 16, 1971. The following morning, many of the VIPs left Persepolis, and those who stayed were crowded in coaches and driven to the airport in Shiraz and flown to Tehran. The celebration ended with a few more programs in the Iranian capital, including a spectacular inauguration of the Shayat Tower in honor of the king. Keeping other things aside, the celebration was successful in itself. The Shah had shown the world how to really throw a party. Public all over the world discussed the sumptuous dresses and jewels of Farah, the Shah's wife. Another popular topic was the pet dog of the Ethiopian emperor with its diamond-studded collar which looked more expensive than most jewels worn by the queens and first ladies. Time magazine called the party the greatest gathering of the century. Stern called it the mother of all parties. Life magazine, the party of the century, and a major Swiss magazine named the party Billion Dollar Camping. Some royal houses were impressed, while some were jealous. For a brief moment, Iran was proud, glued to their TV screens to see the Shah getting respect from the world's most powerful nations. That did not last for long. The Shah's effort to promote his country and its history was not appreciated. 
Both in Iran and abroad, the Shah was seen as a money squanderer only wishing to show off. Ayatollah Khomeini, an Iranian revolutionary exiled in Iraq, called the party a, quote, devil's festival. Ordinary Iranians were shocked by the amount of alcohol consumed at the celebration, by scandalous low-cut dresses, and by the absence of Iranian public at the actual ceremonies, which was a sign of imperial arrogance. Speculating the cost, Time magazine put the figure at a shocking $100 million. Adjusted for inflation, that would be roughly $635 million in 2020. France's press doubled those numbers. People in Iran estimated the party must not have cost anything lesser than $500 million in today's money. The Shah's officials refuted these estimates as outrageously large and announced the celebration expenses at $16.8 million. According to the Shah, the cost of the party was only what went into buying food for the guests. They also claimed that the celebration helped raise donations for the construction of 3,200 schools in rural areas of Iran, so the party had a noble cause too. While the general population was struggling to make ends meet, the Shah was throwing a party for his rich friends on an island he had built far from prison and poverty. The Shah had lost all the public support by now. Political parties in opposition, despite their contrasting ideologies, joined hands against the Shah. Three years after the event, the Shah publicly apologized to his people and sought forgiveness for decades of bad decisions, corruption, and cruelty. It was too late. It must be lonely to be Shahanshah. Yes, it's a very, very special case, if I can say so. In what way is it special? I mean to be, as you say, the, the king of kings. And it means that you're lonely because you really have no one to go to for advice who is above you. Well, there's always God. Iran's popular uprising led to the Islamic Revolution of 1979 that ended the rule of the Pahlavi dynasty and the two and a half millennia of the Persian Empire. The Shah took exile in Egypt, where he died a year later. Ayatollah Khomeini returned from exile. Iran became an Islamic Republic and Khomeini its first supreme leader. Thus started the second wave of uprisings and unrest that continues to this day. The festival of Persepolis brought together the rulers of two of the three oldest extant monarchies, the Shah and the Emperor of Ethiopia. By the end of the decade, both the Ethiopian and the Iranian monarchies had ceased to exist. The Emperor of Ethiopia was deposed and murdered by revolutionaries in 1974, three years after the event. In 1973, the Greek monarchy was also abolished. The same year, the Afghan monarchy was overthrown in a coup, ending more than two centuries of royal rule. With monarchies falling like a house of cards, the Shah's party proved to be the last times the legendary and powerful monarchies from around the world gathered and cherished their final days. The tent city continued operating until 1979 for private and government rent after it was looted following the departure of the Shah. Only the iron rods for the tents and the roads built for the festival still remain and are open to the public. The dedicated Shayad Tower, a major landmark in Tehran, was renamed to Zadi Tower in 1979. Hi everyone, I'm Alec Belmore and I narrate videos for Sidenote. I've got a channel of my own that you can check out using the link in the description. Thanks for watching.